This is Michelle with the Austin Movie Show, and I'm here with Richard Kelly of Southland Tales. How are you doing today, Richard? I'm great, and I love that you have a Sparkle Motion t-shirt on. Well, I just want to make it clear to you that I'm not trying to kiss your butt. I love Donnie Darko, and I've, I've loved it for years. It wasn't the first showing. Was it the first showing of this cut uh, the here? Cut. The finished cut yeah, so here at the Fantastic Fest. So how, how did the Q&A go on after the movie? It was great. You know, I got to, to speak with Harry, who is uh, an old friend, and we were able to talk about some of the themes of the film. And like with any q and I think after this film, it's sort of you got to let it sink in and digest for a while. And I think the film definitely, the more, if you get a chance to see it twice, it really, a lot of the ideas come together more. And um, so it was really exciting. It was just great to finally show the finished version. Yeah, because I know that the, the film itself has a lot, of, a lot of themes. There's a lot of information there. So if you could give a very small, <laughs> small kind of uh, explanation to the, to the viewers of what the movie is about, we can start from there. Well, I guess uh, Harry did a great job of kind of synopsing the film. That's not a word, synopsing. But uh, to, <laughs> to synopsizing, uh, it's a science fiction thriller about the end of the world, and it uh, is about the last three days on Earth in Los Angeles in a parallel universe where uh, America has uh, been sent into a, a, a circumstance after t uh, two, nu two, nu can't talk, two nuclear attacks in Texas, and then uh, we travel over the three years into uh, the course that America has taken. And uh, it... it weaves together a lot of different themes uh, and it's political, it's spiritual, it's religious and it's science fiction and it's film noir. Well it seems to have a very star-studded cast. There's a lot of people in this movie. I mean we've got The Rock, we've got um, um, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Sean William Scott, John Lovitz, Sherry Terry, uh, Nora. Dun I mean, you, yeah, we can just keep so going and going and going and going. It's just insane. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how was it. F I guess the story, I guess, really needed all of all of those characters. But it seems such an epic undertaking to have that many characters, especially of that sort of caliber, that yeah. you're going to have to handle. How did that? How did that work? You know, we, we just kept finding people who fit the role best and, and I think I was, I was looking into pop culture and I was thinking of Saturday Night Live and I was thinking of SCTV and I was thinking of all of our great comedic performers and, and people like Curtis Armstrong and Zelda Rubinstein and John Larroquette who I remember from, from Night Court and he's brilliant you know he's a brilliant actor and it was fun to find all of these people and put them in these, these pivotal roles and I hope that when you see the movie it, it, it gives the movie an energy and a life and a vitality, and they're fun people to watch more than anything. It's like a, a, people you want to have over for dinner. A big cocktail party with all of these people would be very fun to attend. So that hopefully the movie has that sense of energy uh, from, from the, all these performers. So I'm, I'm going to kind of go back to the epicness of this story. So you, there are three graphic novels that, that you wrote that are prequels, kind of pre-chapters to this film. It's, it's just really interesting that you have so much backstory to lend to this movie. How are people really going to connect with it without having the having read that, because I know a lot of just regular Joe Blow American film goers are probably not going to read the three graphic novels first. Well, it is a six chapter story. The, the graphic novels are one, two, and three, and the film is chapters four, five, and six. But what we've, one of the things that we've done in the past year working on the film is we added a three minute animation sequence very near the beginning of the film that kind of gives the viewer a recap of what happens over the three years after the, uh, the, the nuclear attack and it also gives the viewer the essential information from chapters one, two, and three that hopefully will, is just enough to, understand, to lay the groundwork to understand the movie better. And I think if you read the graphic novels, you'll understand the movie on a whole deeper level and a, and a greater level, but if you don't, I think the movie, we've made it a, a accessible in both ways. That was a real challenge to try to do. <laughs> I bet it. <laughs> um, so um, you did screen the movie at Cannes. Yes. Yes, we did. Uh, we screened an, an unfinished version of the film a little over a year ago at Cannes, and um, you know, it, we got nominated for the Palme d'Or, which is a huge honor. And 
we just we brought like an unfinished version of the movie and it was definitely uh, an interesting experience over there but you know it, it, in a way it, <clears throat> the the struggle with the film after can it made the film better because we really we showed it to like the toughest audience in the world and um, we were able to, to, to use that experience to refine the film to try to improve it and and I, I was lucky enough to get more money to add more visual effects shots. And we added almost 100 some new visual effects shots after Can. And I, I think that the movie now fires on all cylinders and it's the best version of the movie that we could possibly have. So, you know, it all worked out for the best. So you, you, you take your, your lemons and you go home and you make lemonade. <laughs> Yeah, so I've t I talked to a few of the viewers, because I know that at Cannes, it's like you're talking about the lemons that you made lemonade out of. They, yeah. It was kind of the, one of the lower-reviewed yeah. um, <laughs> films there, even yeah. though you were nominated for that role, it's like um, yeah. for that award. So, yeah. so who's to say, you know? Right. Um, but I have heard a lot of mixed reviews since, viewing, since the viewing here. I right. mean, there have been people, it's, it's been polar. I mean, it's right. either been, it's been, it was awesome, this is great, oh my gosh, right. or oh my goodness, that was way too much, right. sensory overload, right. I'm not sure what just happened to me, right. um, I have to go you know, think a little while, yeah. and then there's the ones that are like, I'm not even gonna say a word until I sleep on this. Right. So with those sort of kind of across the board kind of reviews, um, how are you? How are you feeling about the the release in November? I feel great. I, f I feel very confident. I know it's a movie that, the more you think about it, the more it sort of coalesces. The ideas all start to come together, and it really is a, a movie that I hope people will try to see a second time if they're if they're kind of not sure what they just saw or they feel the sensory overload. Because when you see it a second time, it it, it, it all it all hopefully melds together better in your mind. And I think it was a similar thing that we had with, with Donnie Darko when it was first released. A lot of people kind of walked out like, what the hell is this? What did I just watch? And then we hope we've made a movie that sticks with you and, and, and is worthy of, uh, of, of uh, repeat viewings. So, Is there something about the sensibilities of your movies that seem to engage a British audience much quicker and easier than an American audience? Well. I, it's interesting that, that, that I, there seems to be a, a, a very enthusiastic uh, response to, to my work in, in England. I'm honored and, I, and I, I, love, I love the UK and I love going to London. And I think maybe it has something to do with um, it's an older culture. Maybe there's, there's something about the culture being having an old soul. You talk about someone having an old soul. Uh, and maybe there's a more adventurous spirit. European spirit to adventurous art, or, or maybe uh, pushing the envelope in a way. Uh, I don't know. I, that's maybe the something, the web best way to explain it. Or maybe it's just a cultural thing. I don't know. You know, Donnie Darko got released right after 9/11, and, and it was just there was no marketing. And it, certainly, Americans really did ultimately embrace the film and found it on home video. And I think it was just a timing thing, and it was released a year later in the UK. So I think it was just bad timing, you know. And I, I it's been wonderful just to, to have people from all over the world feel like they can uh, embrace a story that is American about an American experience. And certainly, you know, Southland Tales that the it's a very American. It's it's about America in disarray, and uh, you know we're in a very sad place right now as a country and our uh, where we are. Our position in the world seems to have been very damaged, and uh, a lot of people, uh, it, well, we feel like going into the upcoming election that, that, that you know, our generation is the one that needs to, to deal with this and, you know, show up and vote the right way. So, you know, I, I'm proud to be an American and uh, to get to make this movie in, in America. <laughs>